and welcome my citizens to the session of grade 11 learn extra live we're doing life science and i'm ty i'm here with lou's gonna take us through today's session what are we doing today lou biogeography all right so we're going to combine two two subjects in one i think it'll be good oh that sounds pretty interesting <laughs> yeah all right so lou you, while you make your way Mindset is you know the drill by now, you need to get on the page, get chatting to me, let me know what you guys are thinking. You know the link, www.facebook.com forward slash learn extra. Talk to me, let me know what you guys are thinking, if you're lost in here, if you need help. And if you see a mindset in trouble, help them out. Don't be selfish with information. But anyway, moving right along, Lou, take it away. Cool, thanks Ta. Well, um, hope you're all ready, because uh, we're carrying on. It's been quite a few, few weeks that we've been doing body plans and all of these other things. And so we're moving it on and on and on, and we're getting more complicated and more complicated. So uh, the last thing we did on grade 11 was uh, the mammals and that, that those type of animals and how they, their um, bodies adapted. So it was different body parts, right, and how they adapted. Now, this is why they can adapt and what the reason for it was and how they adapted and how they came along. Now, we're going to have a look at biogeography, okay? Now... It's geography and biology together, which is quite nice, right? They are quite interlinked. So let's have a look at it. The definitions, very, very, very important. When it comes to definitions, you need to know them because they always ask you these one-word answers, which is a problem if you don't know what you're talking about. And not only that, if you know your biology terms, it becomes easy to understand what the question is about, right? So let's have a look at the definition. Biogeography, okay? It's the geographical dis distribution of animals, right, and plants over space and time. In other words, how animals and plants moved and, and got into their position and why they look like, like they do and all of that got to do with animals and then, of course, geography, how the land moved, right? And if you have a look at it very carefully, you get biodiversity. We all know what biodiversity is. Remember, I spoke to you a couple of weeks ago about it, so hopefully you do remember, right? The diversity or the number or variation of different animals in a specific area, right? And then, of course, this is the big word, okay? Adaptive radiation. Let me bring it up there so we can actually see. Adaptive radiation. Now, you know radiation as Spider-Man getting bitten by spider and changing into this man that can throw webs around and going mad. It's not that, right? Bio is evolution, okay, from its ancestors and how it changes to adapt to its environment, okay? The whole thing about here is adaption. Okay, so here we go. Let's, let's start this lesson off nice and strong, if I can get it going. There we go. We all start off with before the earth, before we knew the earth, before the earth. That's what it looked like, right? It was one big land mass. It was called Pangaea, right? Now, you're looking at me at the, in, in the screens and you're saying, uh, um, sorry, Lou, but uh, there's a problem. I'm going to walk to South, South America and have a jaw there. It doesn't work like that. There's ocean between it. Okay, now, this is what the land used to look like. Right? And I want you to remember this very clearly because we're going to be talking about animals that are found in different places. How did they get there? Why are they so similar? Right? Now, this is the reason why they're so similar. Okay? The land started moving. Now, if you have a look at it carefully, everything fits in a nice puzzle. Here is, let me see if I can get a nice color, right? pink again. There's Africa, if you, as you can see it. There is South America, right? Can you see how they're fitting in each other? Now, if you take a map, well, you're going to actually see it move. I'm going to try and make it move so that, so that you can understand it. And for the people that do not do geography, listen very carefully. Because my boys that I teach normally, right, they get confused with this because they don't understand how the earth actually moved and how those things move, moved apart from each other. So we, I'm going to explain that because that's the best way I think you could understand it. Right, okay, so let's have a look. That was 225 million years ago. Do you know how long that was? Jeez, I was, I think I was one, one years old, huh? I was one years old, 225 million if years you, ago. If you say so, if you say so, <laughs> Lou, unless you're like the first vampire ever that has never been really recorded, probably. Oh, I'm <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, at least, at least I've still got my looks, I think. <laughs> right, now we're looking at this big word, continental drift. Now, Continental drift does not mean that you've got South Africa moving to a space, right? It's not about the land, the South African, the part that we stand on, okay? That is where people get confused. It's not about that land. We're talking about 
different things, a continent, right? So let's have a look. Pangaea ended up moving into two different big land masses, right? The first one a lot of people know is Gondwana land. There it is, Gondwana land. And the second one is Laurasia, right? Those are the two big land masses. Now, if you have a look at it very carefully, okay, have a look at this. There's South America. North America's up here, right? Did you notice they separated? They were far from each other, okay? So they never used to be, well, they used to be together, but they moved away for a while, okay? You've got Antarctica that came up. You've got Gre uh, um, Iceland and all of that that was close to Africa. They were all together, nice and close together, okay? So all the animals over here, they they could actually be very, very similar. Now, if you think about it, if an animal is found here and here, right, and these things started splitting, do you not think those animals, if they move apart, they're going to be very, 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 very similar, right? That is what biogeography is about, right? About what these animals actually did or how they adapted to get to where they are, right? Okay, so 135 million years ago, okay, we got this, the two big land masses, right? Okay, now we start getting a little bit earlier closer to us, okay? 65 million years ago. Can you see how they're starting to slowly but surely look like it is today? Still look, North America, South America, they aren't touching each other at all, right? Still, Africa's all by itself. Have you noticed how Africa didn't move, okay? Africa didn't move. How nice is that? We are perfect. That is why they normally say that we are the um, where cradle evolution of mankind. started. Sorry, with that? The cradle of mankind. Cradle of mankind, where evolution began, where things always began, because we haven't moved, right? You find b m uh, fossils that are so old over there, right? And you won't believe it, but they actually find fossils over here that's the same as over here. They actually said, Ted, I heard the ones, that um, there is a, a steel belt, right? And it runs across... South America, yeah, and then it stops, and then it carries on over here in Africa, right? Which is quite nice. Also, the plant moves. The plants that are supposed to be there, they're also very similar. Yes, they are going to change, okay? By the type of weather, they have to change. They have to adapt. I mean, if you think about it, if you don't change for winter and summer wear, do you know how cold you're going to be in winter if you have to wear summer wear? And do you know how hot you're going to be in summer if you had to wear winter wear? I mean, we have to change every single um, season. Now, these guys took millions of years to change, okay? Very important. This whole thing is about change, okay? Now, last one. This is continental drift, the present. Now, have a good look at that. Can you see how everything's back together? There's North America. There's South America. Africa, Asia, Australia, the Antarctic at the bottom. Remember, they were all one big mass once upon a time. Okay, now they've moved away. Now, I haven't mentioned once. Now, if you think about it, if they move, you would think that they're floating in the sea. Okay, they are not floating in the sea. It's not this little boats that float on the ocean, right? These are actually land masses. This earth has got a big crust right around it. Okay, remember inside the crust has got lava, hot magma i mean i'm sure you've seen the volcano Ty, have you seen it the volcano that yes. shows where magma comes out of the volcanoes and it's that red liquid lava and that is underneath the crusts right now how did this move that is the key okay so what i've done what i've done is i've actually taken the map and i've drawn black lines now each black line if i did this this piece here um let's get a, a bit of yellow hopefully this would work this part here all of this, right, that is a continent, including everything inside this black line. So this whole piece, I don't know if I can draw it, but this whole piece here, right, everything inside that, that piece, that piece there is a continent, right? And that continent move. It's joined to another continent, as you can see. Each continent is joined to each other. Now, if you say, say to me, but if that is the case, then how come the Earth doesn't get bigger? every time it moves. Because what actually happens is they split. This continent splits from this, so you like like this, the continent splits, and then what fills it? Think about it carefully, that hot magma that comes from underneath, that fills, fills the gap, and it makes it a one continent again, right? A different continent with this one, there's a space between it. Now, one of the main questions is, if we keep splitting them, 
and keep filling up with magma, do you not think that the earth is going to get bigger? So what I did was I actually showed you what it actually looks like. There it is. Okay, As this moves apart, the magma comes up and new land is formed. It's happening all the time. There's a big crust down between, the South, Ameri between South America and Africa. And there's always this big line of red stuff that keeps coming. So the con continents are moving apart. But if the earth is actually staying the same size, we have a bit of a problem. We keep adding, we're never taking away, right? This is where we get those phenomenons, those phenomenons. You know, you know the phenomenons that uh, we always talk about? I'm trying to get more, oh, it won't. The phenomenons that always come down where you get this big earthquakes and all of that. Now, now have a look at this. This is, this is something cool, right? Before we go on to a break, I, I just want to try and explain this quite nice, nicely to you, right? So, now, think about it carefully. If this piece here, this, ah, oh, Matt might not work. I can't see it properly. If this piece works, there we go. If that is a continent, right, there it is. And this piece, so if I color this in, if that is a continent, right, and this one, I'm going to change color to a green, a yellow, and this is a continent, okay, have a look. Can you see how they used to be like this? And of course, with pressure, the one decides to slip. And as it slips, it goes underneath. So this one starts climbing on top of it. And this one, because it's going underneath in those hot temperatures, what do you think it's going to do? It's going to melt. So it melts. And that's how every, part, every time that it moves across, it melts there. And here where it makes a gap, the magma comes out. So for every bit of land we're losing, we're gaining more land. Can you understand how that's working? I hope that's made it nice and clear. That's the, that's the one way of looking at it, right? The second way, what will happen, if I can get the board to work, oh no, wait, it must be here somewhere. Well, the sec second way, the second way is if I take two continents and they push against each other, and we're looking at rugby guys, you know rag rugby, right? And we get to the, the scrum and we hit, and what happens, it falls in, what happens? Both melt. What happens if they push up? What do we get? Think about it carefully. Ty, what do you think we'll get if two continents push up? A mountain range. Ah, nice, a mountain range. So we get this huge, big mountain range. Can you see how everything is coming together, right? That is how the earth moves. That's how continents change and get bigger and move away from each other. And now remember, the more it moves to one side, the more it changes its climate. And the more it changes its climate, the more it changes the species. It has to adapt. Adaption is the biggest thing, as I've been telling you, right? So here we go. That's what, F, that, that's what the world used to look like. Now, the nice thing about it is I've taken some dinosaurs, right? Have a look at it. There they are. I'm not going to say their names. You do not need to know their names. And precisely, I can't, I, can't, I can't actually say it. So just deal with me. Right. There's one big animal, okay? That animal was actually like a, um, a, a, a little... That, that, that one there, um, maybe I didn't see it nicely. That one there... Okay, he's actually a, a reptile mammal. I mean, that sounds very strange, but it's a reptile mammal, right? He used to, if you watch carefully, look how many countries or over how many continents, that's terrible, um, how many continents this one used to go over. It used to go over Africa, India, Antarctic. Look how Antarctic is in the middle. That's those icy places, right? If you look at the second one, we're having a look here. This flower, I'm going to have to change colors again because it's very light. This flower over here, have a look. It went from, from Australia through Antarctica, over India, into Africa, into South, South America. That plant was found everywhere, right? They've found fossils of that fern. It's actually a fern. That fern in every single continent. Now, that's what makes us think that continental drift happened, right? Another one, you've got this animal here. He's actually water a water um, amphibian type of creature, right? He was only found in South America and uh, South Africa, right? W which is, thank goodness he's not there anymore because he looks very, very, very dangerous to me, right? And then you get this guy. Look, he's quite flat-nosed flat, flat -nosed and whatever. I haven't got a clue what he looks like, but he looks like a pretty cool animal, right? He comes from South America and Africa, right? It's, it's not a... The, this is just to show you how widespread these things used to be. Right? It's so cool. It's so nice. Right? Now, they couldn't adapt, so they died out. Right? They died out. We can find their fossils 
all around the plot. Right, so what I want you to do, while you're going on a break, get yourself something to drink, sit down, and we're going to carry on when we get back, right? This is just the start of everything. Okay, I'll see you after the break. Ta. All right, so mindset is, I hope you guys have been having fun because I've been having fun because I find this particularly very interesting. I've always been fascinated by this kind of stuff. But anyway, make sure you do not disappear or go anywhere. Make sure you keep chatting to me on the page. I'm loving the action there. Keep on, po keep on posting. And I want to say happy birthday to, was it, was it Musa? Yes, yes, I saw your post. Musa, happy birthday. But yes, that means stick around. We're going to see you after this break. And welcome back, Mindsetters. Hope you had a nice little break there. And you went to do whatever you had to do. Like I always say, you went to the bathroom, you went to take a leak, or whatever you needed to do. Now you're back, you're ready, you're paying attention, you've got your pens, pads out, and you're going to make some notes. Because before I keep on talking, I'm going to hand it straight to Lou, who's going to teach you the lesson. Take it away. Cool. Thanks, Ta. So, now, we ended off with this. So, now you've seen how the earth goes crazy, and what it looks like, and, and how nice it was, and how different animals were all over the, the earth, actually, even if it was one continent, or just split splitting. So, you've... I hope you understand this. Now we're going to start getting into what the animals were like, right? So if we start off, come on, not too much. There we go. One more. That's it. I don't know if you know what this is. These are a bunch of islands. You must understand this very nicely because you need this form a trick even. So listen carefully. Let's try to get it right now, right? These bunch of islands are close to South America, right? These islands are very, very, very important for evolution. This is where our good friend, Charles Darwin, went and did his studies, right? These are called the Galapagos Islands, right? Over here, he studied a couple of animals. One of the animals were his tortoises, right? He had a look at tortoise, he had a look at finches, and things like that. He went through different animals, and he sat and he drew, and he did whatever he can, and there they are, the Galapagos Islands. They are beautiful islands, right? There's stunning seas, and there's a lot of different animals, okay? So that is where he went. He went to all the different islands around it, right? And he went and collected certain things. But the most important we're going to have a look at, the ones that are the best for us, the ones that we understand the most, and the ones that's going to help us the best, is the finches. Right, so let's have a look at this. You need to know your Darwin finches. You don't need to know big words. You need to know Darwin's finches. Now, Darwin's geographic isolation, geographic, let's just break that up quickly. Geographic, right, is the lay of the land, right? And isolation means that you've separated them into isolation. If you think about it, if you're in prison, not you, if somebody's in prison and he does something bad, they put him in isolation by himself. So geographical isolation is when land splits, so the ground splits, and it changes so that this species, let, let's say there was um, human beings, right, and we over here, and a big earthquake comes along, and it separates some humans from other humans, right, and we can't interbreed with them, and something starts changing, or the food is different, right, then what do we do? We need to adapt to the food that we've got, they will adapt to the food that they've got, and after millions of years, we cannot interbreed, we've become two different species because we couldn't interbreed, we don't have the same things. Okay, so that is geographic isolation. Very important, especially when you do evolution in grade 12, right? And then the original species, uh, they, from South America, the finches, uh, all these things come from South America, these finches. They went into the Galapagos Islands, and the islands moved apart, and something happened to these finches, right? The things that happened to the finches becomes so clear after a while, and you'll see the adaption on how it works, right? Now, no competition from similar species. That's one of the big things. Now, I know that, that one of the questions, Ty, what was one of those, those questions that that boy asked? He wanted to find out, basically this is Takalani. Takalani, yeah. Um, how does predation and competition affect the distribution of species? Okay, so let's, let's start with that. Competition, okay. Now, competition... If, some, if there's a lot of competition around, things are going to move away, right? And if they move away, they start getting further and further away. They've got to start going for different types of food to survive. I mean, let's face it. If you are hungry, you will eat anything, right? So they start eating things, and they start adapting to eat those specific things. So competition chases people away. It makes people stronger, yes, but only the strongest will survive, 
That's what the competition does. It spreads things out and it makes them stronger and harder, right? And they can be perfect for their environment. So competition does move things away and it does start helping with isolation and things like that. Right, if we have a look at it, the development of anatomy. So in other words, we had a look at these finches, their beaks. Can you remember a, a bird has a beak instead of teeth to break open its seeds and stuff like that? These beaks, right, they had to start changing. Okay, if they don't change, they were going to die. There's a big, big reason for that. The changing of the beaks is so important because of the food that was all over the place. And then lastly, the, um, the feeding habits of them, as I said, change, changes their beaks. So let's have a look at it. The first couple of beaks. Okay? Don't need to know the names. You don't need to know what type of finch they are. I want you to concentrate on one specific thing. Okay, the thing I want you to concentrate on is just this piece over here, right? Just that piece. Have a look at that, okay? That finch there eats a certain type of food, right? If you have a look, at, he's got a thin beak, okay? So he won't go for these big, huge nuts, will he, right? The beak has to change, right? If you have a look at it, this is a sharp beak finch, okay? There's, uh, um, what do you call it, uh, x-ray of each one of their heads, right? And if you can see, look how exactly their beaks change. Their beaks change for a specific reason. Now, I'm gonna explain one of the most important things. Darwin, Darwin, they always said, came up with evolution, right? Yes, he got it from other people and he worked on his grandfathers because his grandfather actually started it. And, he, and there was other people like Lamarck and all of those guys, right? And they had their inputs, but Darwin was the most important. He believed, right, that the strongest would survive, okay? Now, survival of the fittest, that does not mean if you can run the furthest that you are going to survive because you're the fittest, no. It doesn't mean that. What it means is that if you can survive on this specific type of food, and this one cannot eat that food, you will live, he will die. You will be strong, he will be weak. Okay, so if we're in the snow and you have a polar bear and you have a brown bear, which one will survive? The polar bear, because it's camouflage. Remember, the camouflage will hide him so he can get to his seals, right? If the brown bear was there, he couldn't get to the seals because he, they can see him immediately. It's very important. Now, if I took a brown bear and a light, light or very, very light brown bear, right? The dark brown bear is not going to be able to catch his food, but the brown bear could still be mistaken very easily in the snow. Do you understand? So the very light bear will eat, the very dark bears won't. So the dark bears will die out, the light bears will survive. They can eat. That's how survival of the fittest actually works, right? Now, Darwin is the big thing about survival of the fittest. Very, very, very important. He believes that, well, that's how our whole study of evolution happens. He believes that if you are strong enough and you adapt it to your environment, you will survive, right? Now, that is why only the strongest breeds. The strongest will breed so that the breed or that, that type of animal can survive the longest. We're the only thing on earth that looks after our weak and our weak actually breed. So it's... Good thing and a bad thing. Good because we're human and we know to love and they also do, do love and we look after things they can't. Okay, so they believe, it's very simple, only the strong survives. Okay, so let's have a look at the beaks. Let's carry on with the beaks. If you can see the beaks, how they change in shape and length, right? All of these things d d d uh, tell us what these animals were eating, right? Now, what I've done is because... I'm sure you all know me by now. I like color. I always have and I always will. So let's have a look at it. There they are. Look how beautiful those finches are. Now, these finch, I hopefully I can get a little bit higher. So uh, too high, not going to work. There we go. These finches are all the different finches that you actually get, right? The most common finch in the beginning was your cactus finch, okay? It's got a long, thin beak, right? A nice, very long, thin beak. And that one, you will notice he started off very small, and then you get the large one, you get the small, and we, we're moving from left to right, by the way, okay? We, this, the, they'll get the large one, which is the next one, you get the very small one, and I want you to have a look at how their beaks ha 
are adapted or how small their beaks are or how big their beaks are. Now, the cactus one, of course, you're going to feed on the cactus and all of that. So they need to do a specific job. They're looking after specific things. Now, if there is a lot of these cactus finch around, right, after a while, there's going to be no more cactus, right? So what actually happens is the guys on the top start fighting with the guys that's after them, right? Some of the cactus finch were chased away. They couldn't eat. So the ones with a different type of beak, right, start looking for other food. If they can start getting other foods, let's go to the next one, the ground finch, right? If they can start eating small little, um, little seeds on the ground, they're going to start surviving. The ones that do not have a stronger beak are not going to survive. So you get, here we go again, the sharp beaked ground finch, you get the small ground finch, you get the medium ground finch, and you get the large ground finch. Now have a look at the large ground finch over there. That's a big thing. That is a nice, strong beak. That came from eating bigger, think about it, bigger seeds. The bigger the seeds, right, the harder you have to bite, the more muscle you have. Okay? They don't want to, if you don't have a big muscle, you are not, or a big beak or something to chew on, you are not going to be able to crack those nuts. Right? So as they go along, the beak gets bigger and stronger. All to do with its food. Okay, so after that. You get the gray wom num num. I'm never gonna get that word right. Okay. You get the the wombler uh, finch. You get the green one. You get the vegetation one. You get the woodpecker. Woodpecker. We all know what a wood woodpecker does. Can you remember what a woodpecker does? Yes. It basically uses its beak to keep pecking at wood to create oh, a hole. Oh, nice, nice. A woodpecker it pecks the wood. Plain and simple as its name goes. Right. So he's gonna normally knock in the wood and make its whole uh, its, its whole nest in a piece of wood. He's also gonna dig. Hit in there, he's going to remove the bark, he's going to remove little um, insects and worms and all of that out of the bark. So he needs a nice, long, strong, solid beak to be able to get the wood off, right? That's his job. And then you get the mangrove finch, which stays in the mangrove forest, so he's going to be in between the mangroves and it's going to be wet and it's going to be slimy and sticky and all of that type of thing. So his beak is a certain shape to be able to handle the food that he's going to survive on. Right, so there are your finches. Those are the ones that Darwin studied. He's the most, the, this is, this, this, these, how many finches are there? Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen finches, if I'm not mistaken. My math is very bad at the moment, right? Fourteen finches is what he classified or he studied. This was the most important thing that he got his award for was Darwin's finches. This is what got evolution going. Right. This is where evolution, not started, but how we started understanding it. Right. And all of this comes from one, one main thing, okay? It's biogeography, the moving of the earth so that they can adapt to their environment and the food that they have to eat. Right, so let's have a look. The next thing we're going to have a look at is flightless birds. Now, yes, we've had a look at, you, you know, about certain flightless birds, like the ones that swim. Now, we're not talking about the ones that swim. We're not talking about your penguins. We are talking about your big birds that cannot fly. Can you give me a big bird that does can't fly? Ostrich. Ostrich, very nice. So that's an ostrich. Ostrich meat is very nice, very clean, by the way, right? Now, an ostrich is very, very big, right? The ostrich, or should I say the big birds, are actually called ratites. There they are. They're on a, they've got their own little group, right? They're ratites. Now, ratites are flightless birds, big flightless birds. Now, a ratite, the earliest and the biggest ratite we know, right, is the moa. Now, the moa comes from Australia. Oh, New, New Zealand, sorry. Comes from New Zealand. The problem with the moa is that it is extinct, right? Because it's been extinct, we just find its bones everywhere. But we found that in New Zealand. Okay, so just think about this. New Zealand is like oh, that side of the world. Right? Then we get to the next one, which is your ostrich, which is over here, is your South African bird. Right? Then you're going to get your rhea, which is your South American bird, that's over here, all the way on the other side. Have you noticed it's gone right around the whole, the whole world almost? Right? And we mustn't forget the emu, which is in Australia, that's quite close to uh, New, New Zealand. Right? Now, we, if you go to the, um, the zoo or whatever, you can see the ostrich, the emu, and the, the rhea. You can see them, they are there. They look very, very similar. Not identical, but very similar. Okay, so <clears throat> if I started off, if I can get it, the flightless birds, 
Okay, they have a flat sternum, so this bone that's in between your chest, flat sternum, right, nice and strong and solid. The problem is their wings are very, very, not writing, very, very, very small. Okay, so they cannot take off on it, which means that they ha their bodies had to get larger. Okay, the bigger they are, the more protection they can have. The heavy legs, okay, they've got to have big, strong, solid legs, right, and um, no positional toe. They've got only toes facing the, the, the front. Okay, so very important. So before you go on to a break, what I want you to do, I'm going to give you a question now. You've got a couple of minutes, not even, about two or three minutes, and I want to know why do you think that these animals, these flightless birds, have big, strong feet. Very simple. Big, strong feet. I want you to use your imagination, and I want you to think why they would have it. Right. And then get back, back to me as quick as you can. Ta. Right. On that note, I'll be making sure that I look out for those answers. So mindsetters, make sure you get on the page and let me know what you guys are thinking. But on that note, we're going to see you after this break. And welcome back, Mindsetters. Hope you had a nice little break there. And you're back, you're ready, you're good to go. You've got your pens, pads out, and you're going to make some notes. Very important to have a pen, pad out, make notes, because if you don't make notes, you kind of can't pass. Because as much as people say, oh, I've got photographic memory, those don't exist. Don't be lied to. But anyway, <laughs> moving right along, I'm going to hand it over to Lou. Lou, take it away. <laughs> Thanks, sir. <Ty. laughs> now, I know I've had a look, some of the answers, right? The first one that got it right, that I saw... Takalani, well done, big man. What actually happens is these brothers are there on the ground and there's going to be things that is going to attack them, right? They need some type of defense, right? So what we have here is a big foot. Have a look at that. It's a huge foot. There's three toes. And have a look at the middle one over here, right? It's big. Now, I can promise you now, no matter how fast you run, that thing's going to catch you. And you think that your SA soccer players can kick or whoever you, you, you support. I don't care if it's... If it's um, rugby. Rag, no, soccer. Rugby, soccer. I mean, it doesn't matter if you come from Liverpool or Man United or Arsenal or whoever it is, right? These things kick 10 times harder than any one of those players put together. They will kick everything out of you. The best thing to do, by the way, if you ever get chased by these things, is fall down on the ground because all it's going to do is jump on you. How cool is that? It only jumps on you. It can't kick you. But I promise you, if you run, you will be kicked like you've so never hard. been kicked <laughs> before. It is so sore, you have no idea. These guys have big feet, and they're there to protect themselves, right? They lay their eggs down. I promise you, anything goes near their eggs, they're going to know about it. Those guys are so strong and so fast, you won't get away from them. Right, they are very fast, very, very important. Big feet for protection. Right, so, um, before, be before, oh wait, let me, let me go there. Let me just put this up here so you can see where they actually come from. I just put them, the emus Australia, the moas New Zealand, you get South Africa and the ostrich, and you get South America, which is the rear. Right, look at all the different places they come from, all over the world. Right. Now, during the break, I had a look at the, the, the Facebook page, right, Ty? Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the questions that came up is, what is the difference between extinct and extinct? Okay, now, I want you to have a good look at my picture that's on the board. Just have a look at the board itself, okay? So, have a look at the emu. There it is, a good look at the emu. Have a look at the moa. Have a look at the ostrich. Have a look at the rear, right? Now... One of those birds are extinct, and the other one are extinct. Okay, so one of them are extinct, and how can I notice by just looking at the pictures? Ty, do you think you could, you could be able to tell me? Which one do you think there is extinct? Extinct would be the, I would say, the moa. The moa. Very nice, because there's background to these. We have a photograph of it, right? You can see the background. You can see the grass, the vegetation. The moa is just black, right? So what they've done is they put a computer thing around it. They've got its bones. They put computer around it. And people who 
I suppose have seen it, will um, we'll, we'll recognize it, right? But the mower is extinct. The other ones are extinct. In other words, I'm extinct. means I'm alive. I'm living. There's still a lot of us. Humans are extinct. They're not extinct. Extinct means not on the world anymore. Extinct means still here. Okay, so hopefully that, that answers your question. Now, you've seen this. This is the distribution of the ratites, right? They're all over the world. Yes, they're not on the top anymore. They're right down here at the bottom. Remember, these ones were all joined together. Okay, they were all linked together in a puzzle. If you remember the first Kondwana land. Oh, not, not Kondwana land, Pangaea. Right, do you remember that? That is how they used, used to look. Right, now, let's go. If I have a look at the flightless birds, the ostrich, there it is. I took a nice big picture of it. I've got the ostrich, right? Can you tell me what that is? That one is very simple. I mean, look, that looks prehistoric, right? That one there is the emu. That is a prehistoric moa, right? And that is the rear. Very nice. You see how they all look at their feet, strong feet, right? I'm trying to get it there. You can't see his feet. Strong feet. And, of course, the ostrich that will kick like you have no idea is his feet, right? Now, rat tarts. There were, once upon a time, nine different species, right? Nine different species of moa in New Zealand. They have become extinct mainly because of us again. Well, what do we do? It's a bird that's on the ground. We don't care. We don't have, we're not going to go run and try and bite it on the neck like an animal does. No, we'll throw something at it. So we'll kill it from a distance so it can't get to us. So it's mostly dead from us hunting, right? And its closest relative, you will not believe this, is the tinnimus. Now, the tinnimus is a South American bird that can fly. Okay, it's a little bird and it flies perfectly fine. Okay, the tinnimus most probably branched out and became a little bit bigger. The wings did, didn't develop and now it's stuck on the ground. So now it has to evolve so that it can protect itself on the ground because its wings didn't get big enough. So that means it must run on the ground all the time. Right. You must also understand that there was a nice thing that I've seen. It's evolution is not always cool. Right. I know that. I saw a nice picture. It, it just made, made my day, this nice, nice picture. You get this Tyrannosaurus rex, right? And this thing gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and becomes a kiwi, right, in Australia. How cool was that? From a big lizard down to a small little bird. I thought that was the coolest thing in the world. Right, so next thing we're going to have a look at. I want you to have a look at this. This is the nicest thing to me, right? Remember, I love my animals, right? So I want to look at the, 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 the things with the tusks and the trunks, right? Your elephants. Now, how many type of elephants do you think we get? Okay? I know of three. So I'm going to go through them very slowly. And you don't need to know the elephant. You never had to know the elephant. Okay? The elephant, I'm just so getting used to. I like using different things. So I'm using the elephant to explain how things moved and how they changed to all over the world to adapt to their environment. Right? So, let's have a look at the first one. Okay? We have the African elephant. And the second one, we have the Asian elephant. Now, there's only two, and I told you I know of three. But we will get to the third one just now. Okay? The elephant. You won't believe it, but it should be... No, are we going that way? Yes. An elephant's ancestors began evolution 60, 60 million years ago. The modern day elephant, right, has got a trunk. It used to be used, it used to be a, 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 an aquatic animal. It used to use its trunk to snorkel, right? It used to use it to breathe underwater. How cool is that? Now you can still see it today. If you go watch a herd of elephants, they go into the water and they bathe and here comes a snout out and it's sucking up the air and, and it's relaxing and it's enjoying life, right? That's what it uses its, its, its nose for, right? Now, Elephants are closely related, right, to the manatees. Now, do you know what an manatee is? Those are cool little animals, right? Your manatees and your dugons. But I'm sure a lot of you have never heard of a dugon. Some of you might have heard of an, a, a manatee, right? But your dugons, that is quite a strange little thing. Okay, now, let's pull it down so we can actually get about 
and I was so right, look at that. There are three species of elephants. You get your African elephant, okay? But your African elephant is divided into your savanna elephant and your forest elephant. And then, of course, you get your Asian elephant, okay? Elephants were found all over the world. They were on every single continent of this earth, right? But they have died out, and only these three have survived. The rest of them have died out. We've killed them. So all these people that are poaching are not helping us really. right? One day I'm sh there was an ad on TV that was trying to explain an elephant. Can you remember? I don't know if you've mm. seen it. I haven't seen it. I don't think a so. guy standing around a campfire and telling all the people about an elephant. And once upon a time there was this elephant with this big nose and had big tusks. And he couldn't explain it properly because it's gone. You ha how do you explain something that you cannot see? I know we have pictures. But what I'm trying to get at is these were all over the world. It's always been all over the world, right? And if it's all over the world, why have they died out? Certain things happen, right? Now, what's nice about the elephants is that they come from this animal. Okay, that animal there is a, can you know what that is? That is a manatee. Manatee. It is a beautiful little puppy. Yeah, cool. Look at that face. Right? It's a beautiful, it's got a stunning face. Right? I love the manatees. They are so cute. They look like a cuddly little toy. Hey? That is your manatee. Right? Now, the elephants come from that. Okay? That is the first ancestor of the amenity. The second one, the second one is your, can you remember? Dugon. Can you remember Dugon? That is a vacuum cleaner of the sea. Look at that. It looks like it's got this funny mouthpiece. Look at it funny mouthpiece, and it's sucking up all along the ground. That is what its proboscis was, right? Its proboscis sucks along the thing. That is a beautiful animal, right? That's where your elephants come from. They don't look very cool, right? But that is where elephants come from. Now, please understand that elephants have come from different generations, 60 years, okay? Now, you've all, a lot of you have seen things like Ice Age, right? So you know about... Um, Manfred, Manfred. Manny. Manny, that's it, Manny. Manny is a, do you think about it? Do you know? He was a woolly mammoth. A woolly mammoth, very nice. A woolly mammoth, big tusks, okay? Very, very big tusks, okay? And he had hair everywhere to protect him from the cold. Remember, it was during the ice ages in those times. So the, the ice ages come along, right? And it's got to keep nice and warm. So it's got this big furry coat. Right? Can you remember on, on there, it's got this big thing on the top of the head and everything. Now, you're not going to believe this. I've come to this part of the show where I just want to explain to you what is the difference between elephants. And I'm going to shock you at the end of the show. So, let's have a look at it. On the one side, I've got the African elephants. And on the other side, I've got the Asian elephants. Now, before I show you the difference between them, I want you to look at the African elephants. An African elephant, there's two. There's a the savanna elephant and the forest elephant. Now, a savanna elephant has big open place, right? So what do you think it's going to be? Nice, big, strong animal, right? And if you get the forest elephant, what is going to be in its way? A lot of trees. So what's going to happen to this animal? It's going to decrease in size, okay? So your African elephant, the two of them are, the savanna elephant is nice and big and strong and solid. And then your forest elephant is a little bit smaller, but almost identical, right? Now... While we're doing this, we're going to go through and have a look at what the two elephants, which is Asia and your African, because they're on two different continents, even though they look the same. A lot of people can't tell the difference. So let's find out the difference. Okay. Now, firstly, the weight of them. Okay. The African elephants, about 4,000, and the, uh, between 4,000 and 7,000 kilograms, right? And the Asian elephant is 3,000 to 6,000. Right? It's, it's quite nice. As you can see it over here. Uh, let me get some color going. It's over here. They're nice and big. Right? So all in all, the African elephant is a lot bigger than the Asian elephant. Okay? Now, meters in height. That shoulder. So when it's bending over where its shoulder is, the African elephant is about four meters. Okay? And the Asian elephant is two to three and a half. So it's a lot smaller elephant. Now, the skin... The Asian elephant is a very, very wrinkly. Now, wrinkly is there for a reason, okay? Smooth 
is there for a reason. If you look at the savanna, it is very, very hot and dry, right? So if it's very wrinkly, right, it's going to keep all its skin, skin together. It can get everything in its, in its grooves and it keeps itself cool, right? Whereas the Asian elephant, in Asia, it's very moist, okay? Now, because it's moist, it has a nice smooth skin so it can get over it. Now, can you think of any way that these animals are going to keep themselves cool? Because the Asian elephant and the African elephant have two different ways of keeping themselves cool. Remember, Africa, dry, hot conditions, right? Asia, it's hot but humid, means there's water in the air. And if there's water in the air, it cools them down. Okay, so now, I'm going to answer that, that question in a few minutes, right? If we carry on with it, okay? Number of ribs, one's got 20, one's got 21 pairs, okay? Everything of this animal is a lot smaller. Everything in Asia is a lot smaller. What you will can't believe is that even their bellies have changed. If you have a look at it, this one's at an angle down. Oh, that's not going to work. This one's got a downward angle. This one's either is normally got a flat, okay? So the whole elephant is a lot smaller, okay? Now, how cool is this? If I bring it down, have a look at them. The two beautiful animals next to each other. Now, if you have a look at them face on, you can already tell me the one has got big ears and the one has got small ears. And the nicest thing about the elephants is the African elephant is in the shape of Africa. The Indian elephant, the shape of India. Okay, have a look at this. See these two hard, it's nice and black. Those two big hard pieces up there. Can you see them? This elephant doesn't have it. You see how it's nice and smooth. Okay, the African elephant is nice and smooth. The Asian elephant is not. Do you know that the Asian elephant is more, is closely related to the woolly mammoth? than the African elephant. So that is cool. The, remember that if you look at Manny, it, is, it was Manny, huh? Yes. Manny, he had that big bump on his head, right? This guy doesn't. Oh, I mean, this, this guy doesn't. This one still has those bumps there, right? So he's closer to anybody else, right? The ears are the most important thing. I want you to remember the ears, okay? Look at their teeth structure. It's completely different. Remember, that's not what their teeth looks like from the side. It's from what you look in the inside to the top of their teeth. Their teeth are different for the different type of things that they eat, right? This elephant normally eats trees, okay? This elephant eats grass. Two different habitats, two different uh, ways of eating the grass, right? Uh, or, or, or the veg vegetation, should I say. So that is quite cool. Another thing is this elephant has a lot of rings around in its trunk, and its trunk is very flexible, where this one, has a lot less rings, right? And it's not as flexible. It's because it's got to pick up grass. It doesn't need it to be as flexible as this animal to get up here and all over the place, right? That is a nice thing. Some more. I'm just giving you, please understand, this can never be in a test. This is knowledge for you to understand why things would change, why it needs to, right? The African elephant, the male and the female have tusks. The Asian elephants, only the males have, have tusks, okay? Lastly, there was a nice thing. When it comes to rings, when it comes to the top of their, of their mouth, you know, you know that long, long nose of theirs, right? If I look at the African elephant, let's get some yellow going. If I have a look at the African elephant, the African elephant looks, the edge of its nose looks round about like that. Okay. The, uh, the, the Asian elephant will look like that. Now, if you have a look at it, they actually say that it's got two lips. The two lips are to be able to grab things. Okay, so you've got the, the nose coming out and the two things to grab, and this one does. This has got to do with grass. This one's got to do with trees and all of that, right? Which is unbelievable. All these things is ad adaptations for where it lives. All, of, all it is has got to do with geographical things. Okay, now that I've explained that to you, and remember, it's called elephants, okay? The elephants don't actually come with each other. They don't, they don't belong to each other. The African elephant and the Asian elephants are two completely, completely different elephants, right? They might have had once upon a time something, 
but that's it. Okay, so on that note, guys, study well, good luck, and I will see you next week. Ta. All right. Wow. I enjoyed that lesson, as most of you have pointed out on the page. <laughs> but, guys, I just want to say thank you so much for posting on the page. I just want to say thank you to Zubuya, Kloby Joyce. I don't know if I said that right, but I'm trying. Chloe, um, Takalani, Zubuya, Tofua, I just want to say thank you guys for posting. And guys, keep on posting so you can get those shout-outs. But for me, this is where I sign out and say thank you and see you next time.